Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Karina Lesser. I'm the Artistic Director of Scripps Presents. It's so great to have all of you here tonight. Um, as many of you know, um, throughout the year, Scripps Presents uh, seeks to bring exciting, entertaining, um, relevant artists, writers, and scholars from across the disciplines. And tonight is no exception. Um, this past fall, we've hosted folks like Lena Waithe, um, Abby Jacobson, um, the sociologist Eric Kleinenberg, among dozens of others. Um, tonight's special because it's actually our last program of the season, and we're so delighted to have Nathan Englander and David Ullin um, joining us. So a little bit more about our guests tonight. Nathan is the author of the novel The Ministry of Special Cases and the story collections for the relief of unbearable urges and what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, winner of the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award and finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. In addition to a celebrated fiction, he is also a translator. I am a particular fan of his work with Edgar Carrot. Um, of his latest novel, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, Colson Whitehead writes, Englander's latest is, as usual, superb, a work of psychological precision and moral force with an immediacy that captures both timeless human truth as well as the perplexities of the present day. Tonight, he'll be in conversation with Los Angeles literary treasure, David Ullin. David is the author of, most recently, The Lost Art of Reading, Books and Resistance in a Troubled Time. Please help me to welcome Nathan and David to Scripps. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're going to talk for about 40, 45 minutes or so, and then we're gonna turn it over to some questions from you all. But before we start, Nathan is gonna read a small excerpt from the book from uh, Dinner at the Center of the Earth, uh, just to sort of set us up, give us a flavor. And um... Um, uh, thank you so much for doing this, and thank you all for coming. We all have devices we could be looking at, but here we are. Um, I appreciate it. Oh yeah, there's literally, uh, it's like a punishment for 20 years of loyal service from my uh, publisher, but uh, yeah, this book, it's, it's unset upable. It like almost killed my editor, I think. You know, it's like, it only sounds like a telenovela. You're like, the general's in a coma, prisoner Z has disappeared. It's truly insane. And there's maybe like, uh, I'm so glad we have a literary pro here to help us unwind it, but it is very intentionally circular. It has maybe like seven timelines and 5,000 realities. It reads in a linear fashion. Don't be frightened to read it. But uh, I'm never trying to sell books. My wife gets mad all the time. People are like, what do you do for a living? And I always say nothing. She's like, nothing is a crazy answer when people ask what you do. What book should I read? Nah, eh, don't read my book. Anyway, but, uh, oh yeah, so I'm just gonna read this utterly unrepresentative uh, couple of pages so you can hear my voice. Um, yeah. How it had come to this, prisoner Z felt, had been set so very early, his Jerusalem, his Israel, his end. He'd been given it so long ago, back in suburbia, back in America, a birthright spoon-fed to him in his Jewish day school classroom, a little boy with a heavy prayer book and a yarmulke like a soup bowl turned over and resting atop his head. It is second grade, and they are running the children with their arms outspread, they are flying. The desks are pushed together, the teacher's orders, their lovely 18-year-old teacher who would soon get pregnant and disappear. They know enough, the boys and girls, to love this black-haired lady who's even more black, more beautiful hair, peeks out from under her wig as she pushes the big desk, the teacher's desk, towards theirs. She dresses modestly, but there is no modest when you are a beautiful, raven-haired, 18-year-old, second-grade teacher flushed from trying to get pregnant in all your free time. Their love for her was different from what they felt for the others. It was marrying love and wanting to be her love, and it was youthful, energetic teacher love, and they would do anything for her, anything at all. So when after morning prayer, after marching into the room with their big green sudurum and taking their seats, when she'd stood and jutted out her bottom jaw and blown the hair from her eyes, when she'd said, up, up, and raised her hands, raising the class so easily with them, prisoner Z's no longer sure if she'd actually spoken the up, up at all. We are going somewhere and we are late is what she says. Where are we going? Asked Bacha, whose English name is Beth. 
A smile from the teacher, a glimmer to the eye. We are going, my little Yiddelach, to Yerushalayim. We are flying right now to Israel. The Mashiach is coming, and we need to get there. We need to help welcome him in. And the hands again are waving, and we are all already following. Now push, push the desks together so we can get up into the sky. And when those desks are all together, a circle around the room, the teacher takes one of our tiny chairs, raising her skirt so we can see her ankles swathed in her scratchy gray tights. She places a foot on the seat of that chair and then climbs onto those child-sized desks. A teacher, a teacher standing on a desk. It is glorious. She bends a bit at the knees and leans her head forward. The teacher then spreads her arms wide. She says, I am on an airplane. I am an airplane. We are all flying to Israel together to make Aliyah. We are headed to Jerusalem. We must hurry, hurry, a long flight, and the Messiah already on his way. And she takes off like that, flying from desk to desk around the room, tilting her beautiful covered arms on the turns. Come, she says, come. You do not want to be left in gullus, forgotten in this Egypt. When the Messiah comes, our country awaits. And it is roly-poly Bensi was first up. And then Mayor Aryeh follows, flashing his monkey grin. There are Devorah and Yocheved, Susan and Zev. And then I am on the chair. Prisoner Z feels himself rising. But with all those arms tilting and everyone running and howling and flying, I'm too afraid to join. And suddenly I am grabbed, and suddenly I am lifted. The teacher has got me, she is holding me, and she sets me down in motion. And that is love, and that is care. She holds on until my feet are moving and my arms spreading, until I too, I feel it, until I am looking down at the classroom below, down at New York, at America, until it all looks like desert and all looks like wasteland, nothing but the emptiness that is the whole world outside what God gave us. Thanks. Thank you. I'm glad you read that passage because let's start with this. I think what you've written here is a kind of... Um, it's a love story. I mean, it's many, many things. We'll talk about, hopefully, some of those things. But at heart, it's a love story. But it's a love story that is um, both personal and kind of cultural in some way. And I'm wondering if we can just start by talking about that, and then we'll sort of circle. We'll, we'll circle like the book does. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> So, yeah, the book, it starts out as, you know, that's what the publisher likes, like political thriller, but then it becomes like a magic realist history of Israel and Palestine, and then it becomes a love story that turns into a love story allegory. So, yeah. Right, and in many ways, it's kind of a, a love story, I, I don't know, in a weird way, is a love story between Israel and Palestine in some sense, not only between characters who are Israeli and Palestinian, but in some way the a tortured love story, no which question. Is, which is what it is and what it should be and what I am tortured by. Yeah, it's a really personal book. I, I wanted to write this book for near 20 years. You know, we were talking about it, you know, um, I'm working on the gray, it's coming in nice. So anyway, but uh, it's like the first historical period that I've lived through. Like I am, you know, we're on a college campus. Like I am older than people now. That is shocking news. Once it happens to you, you're like, I am older than people. But uh I like I moved like the personal part is I moved to Israel for peace. I moved there to be a part of the peace process and I'm obsessed, you know, I wrote an Argentina novel about the dirty I am obsessed with dual realities, multiple realities and the construction of realities and again this government sucks up all the air in the room. They don't get our time in here right now. But this notion of the willful creation of realities by governments, truths that made that become truth. You know what I'm saying? That, that it actually becomes truth. Who writes history? And I am telling you that I moved to Jerusalem for peace, and peace was right there, and we were going to make peace, and there were only two sides. And again, I, you know, we were already talking before the question and answer for this book. My, you know, they're super fun sometimes. Anyway, but, you know, nonetheless, like, there's only two sides to me on the Israel-Palestine issue, which is, are you pro-peace or against it? And if you're against peace, I don't know what you're for, perpetual war? Right. You know what I'm saying? I wrote this book... A hunk of this book, a good part of it, takes place on the Gaza border with Israel. Yep. And, you know, back to its circular nature is it makes me insane that you can have wars. Look up Gaza War on Wikipedia when you get home. They have names. like It's like Fast and Furious movies, like Cast Lead, Grapes of Wrath. Like, you can't have a war that happens on schedule that eats people. 
You know what I'm saying? Like again and again and again and act like that's inevitable. It's not inevitable. And again, back to, uh, I don't know how this room breaks down. Pick whichever side you want to use that I said first. But I'm saying as soon as that war is over, Hamas is planning, you know, they're building missiles, they're working on the next attack, and Israel, as soon as the war is over, is planning, is working on the next attack, and Israel not only works on the next attack, it's called, the term is mowing the lawn. They not only hit the current targets, they hit the targets that they're guessing are going to be the, you know, the targets that they know Hamas is going to build up for the targets. So they're both working two wars ahead. And every, do you know how many times on this book tour that this is a really current event, even if we're busy with who Melania is firing today or whatever the nonsense is to distract us from the fact that, you know, uh, thank you for coming out. I'm really sad about these fires and the floods and we need to save our planet, but we are being distracted from important things. But here I am, and guess what? My book's current events again because there's been another fight at Gaza. There's been another war that just Bibi's now in trouble. When do I side with Bibi? But Netanyahu's in trouble for not go starting a full war. And, you know, like, it's every couple of months I'm at an event and there's another set of deaths one side or the other and it's surely you know a lot more Palestinians uh, you know of late uh, at that border but nonetheless it's just insane that this cycle can go on and on and so I that's back to the circular nature of this book it's built of two things which is yes it is a love story because you know I don't know what else there is to do but find the love that needs to be there and I'm not a touchy-feely person this is a strategic you know, issue that I'm plotting, which is peace serves everyone. Well, and also I think the, it, it's interesting because given that sense of, uh, given the history that you're talking about, given sort of the story that we're living in, yeah. the love story becomes the most unexpected part of it all, whereas that should be the, the center. I mean, not the center yeah, of the yeah. book, that should be the center of everything. Yes. But the idea of reconciliation, whether personal or political, becomes the most fantastic element of, this, of the story um, even more than the elements that are in fact fantastic. Because it's become almost outside of reality, that expectation. That's the point. But that takes work. You know what I'm saying? That, that's what I was interested in, to get to the situation where like, this allegorical love story is possible. Like, it took so much work on both sides to make it so that that's you know, such a crazy notion. Right. So going back, you say, so you've, you've been, you were thinking about this book for 20 years from... Um, Intifada from, 2, basically. Right, okay. September 2000. How, let, can, let's talk about how, it, how the idea developed. Um, what was it, what were, when you first started thinking about it, what were you thinking about? Oh, uh, think, uh, we were talking about, uh, yeah, you know, it's, you think as a reader, like you end up working on the books, what you want, what, what I didn't want is, uh, you know, now we all like to say mansplaining. I didn't want mansplaining. I didn't want my 700-page journal of my sadness at a fallen priest process or somebody from Long Island lecturing you about the Middle East, you know, that I'm an expert because I eat a lot of hummus. You know, like, I didn't right. want any of that stuff in there. And I also... There are certainly a lot of people from Long Island who lecture yeah, us on the Middle yeah, East. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we, lo we love the hummus. Anyway, but uh, you know what is... I, I, like, I, uh, I know what is... is you know, we all have, it's always surprising to me when people be like, you know, you're a Jewish writer. And I'm like, what? I've never written about a Jew in my life. That's always a surprising thing for, I've been writing for 20 years now. I have a book that comes out on, uh, in April that'll be like on my 20th writing anniversary. But um, yes, but I still do look so young. It has been 20 years. Anyway, but uh, oh yeah, this notion, like you, there, there are your things that are not, there are your themes that are not your concern. Jews are people to me, so I'm not writing about Jews, I'm writing about people. That's my default mm -hmm. for humanity. You know what I'm saying? Like, I refuse to see myself as other, which is, you know, the big point of it. But what I'm obsessed with is injustice and dual realities, and I guess, like, that's the core idea. My novel before this one about Argentina, it is, in, the, in a sense, those are those same themes. I guess... What I wanted to do, this book was twice as long, and why there's a literary thriller element, I wanted people to sit down and turn pages, and this is a concept, I love John Gardner, I think he's fallen out of fashion, but it's, I guess, on, on moral fiction. I read books because they change me, and fiction, I read books, fiction, this is the John Gardner quote, mashed up, but it's a place to reflect and test values. And I think that's a beautiful thing. And this is a horrible choice for a novel if you want to get along with people. But I thought there is no subject 
in the whole world that I can think, again, now you'll come up with never speak in truisms or absolutes, but really, anyone who's going to be here tonight or who's going to read a book like this, if you're interested in Israel and Palestine, you have a side and you're you know, people are so locked and sure and immobile. And to quote this rabbi who tortured me a lot, it's probably, I like to blame him for why I'm not religious, but there's one thing he did say that I like a lot, back to concepts. He said, uh, anyone more religious than me is a fanatic. Everybody thinks they're center. <laughs> no, you know what I'm saying? So I wanted just to write a book about Israel and Palestine where I really tried, obviously I'm me and it's my brain, but I wanted all realities to flip, everyone, you know, names flip, characters flip, scenes flip, everything in its opposite. I wanted to build a Schrodinger's cat dual reality book where you could just explore your feelings on Israel and Palestine, but in a, you know, have, there's a love story, it's a political thriller. I just, that's why, no lecture from me. I worked so hard not to take sides in this book because I wanted people just to experience Israel, Palestine, and feel how they feel. And uh, Harvard Bookstore, the man, do they grill you there. This woman, you know, I almost gave the answer. She got so mad at me. She was like, you do take a side. You do take a side. And I was like, I really, I, I was like, you can find a side, but my intent was no sides. And she said, this book is pro-peace, which I already said, and she saved me. It was early on in the tour, and I thanked her for that. Because I was like, oh, yes, I am pro-peace, but that's not a side. So many things are under assault. Like, there is no right side to perpetual war. No, I agree. I think that's exactly right. But I end up arguing that. I don't know what people are always like want to argue this point. I was like, because, I'll, I'll go for peace. Well, yeah. But don't you think that there's the sense that, you know, I mean, there's that sense that being right is, I'm not, this isn't what you're arguing, but the, the other argument wouldn't necessarily, the pro-war side wouldn't necessarily present itself as pro-war. No, it, it doesn't present, present itself, itself as, as, as right, right? Like there is, we are going to do these. This, people this, have their own visions and I'm saying, you know, yes, yes, it's, it's, it is a, this is what we're getting into. We're already going to like, it is, that's why, uh, till you, people are like, who are not interested in the region, they're like, what's the problem in Israel? It's a bunch of Jews, you know? And then you're like, well, it's 20% Israeli Arab, and then there are the Palestinians, and then there's, you know, Sephardi Jews and Ashkenazi Jews, and right, like, everything fragments. So yes, it is a two, it's a argument that people treat as two sides that is infinitely faceted. And the other point that really was a core for this book, you asked me about its structure, and there are really two points to its genesis that took me 20 years to figure out. Mm -hmm. One is it took me so long in Jerusalem to understand that people are really trying to broker peace as if it's a difference of opinions. You know, like I can be uh, wildly against school vouchers, and you can be pro, and we can discuss that because we're on separate ends of an argument on a spectrum, but I was living there so long, I think, before I understood, I was a Jewish kid living in Jerusalem, and the holiest Jewish site there, you know, was, you know, Har Habayat was the Western Wall and the Temple Mount, and that my Palestinian neighbors were literally same streets, walking down the same place, eating the same hummus, and they were living in Il-Quds, and their holy site, you know, was Haram al-Sharif, like literally same place, and we are separate cities with the same like super holy site in the same spot and it was literally a different thing not a different opinion not look at that is the dress gray or blue or any of those things you know literally like a separate reality and that really interested me and and maybe back to the circles is uh i always credit marilyn robinson with this i, mm -hmm. I showed up in grad school as 24 and mildly stoned and you know ready to learn and i sat at marilyn robinson's feet and she taught me basically as you've already probably noticed, I'd write a sentence like, I should wait here all day for you to show up at 5 o'clock when we said 3.30, that's a friend. And she's like, that's a lovely sentence, but it's backwards and in a circle and in Yiddish. You know, and she was like, <laughs> so she taught me how I, then she taught me that I think in circles. This is why I write and don't have a radio show. My head is circles, circles, circles. So for 20 years, I controlled those circles to be a writer because you have to, you know, go A to B, but you work on your writerly muscles. And I thought the circular nature of the conflict demands the circles, and, and that also, I finally found a justification for... No, I think that makes a lot of sense. And for me, one of the deep pleasures of this book is that it isn't straightforward and that I have to be engaged as a reader. I mean, not engaged, it's not, I don't mean like I'm, I'm work, it's that it's difficult work, it's 
but that I have to kind of see what's going on and figure it out. You do, you know, even in terms of identities of characters or names, right? Prisoner, Prisoner Z is not Prisoner Z at the beginning of the book, but at a certain point, literally in the middle of a scene, as soon as he takes that passport, he becomes Prisoner Z and is referred to that way, or becomes Z and yeah. is referred to that way um, through the rest of the book. So there's something really interesting about the way that the nonlinear nature of the narrative reflects the nonlinear nature of the characters and their experience, which feels increasingly true to the way, maybe this is also because I'm older than most people in this room probably, but you know, it feels increasingly true to the way the world works, right? That, that sense that we have of a kind of linear, clear-cut, definitive experience is, is fantasy. And I think also you, one wrestles, I grew up really religious, you know, and really small C conservative, big R religious, like, you know, in my Jewish terrarium. And like that idea, like I've had so many realities of who I am already and how I think like this idea, you know, I used to hate it when they'd call it like flip flopping, you know, with politics. They're always on them. Like it's called evolution. You know what I'm saying? Like Obama coming around on marriage equality. That's not like a flip. That's like a person recognizing that we should all have that right as American. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I've changed so many times and I also wanted to look at how that works on politics and individually and how hard that is. I am telling you, I still don't believe in evolution. I can consciously, I know there's, so I believe in evolution, but my brain knows how the world was created in six days. And so I wrestle with that stuff all the time and I see how hard, I can really empathize. God, we have a shortage of empathy. That's the other thing that drove this book. I was really feeling a shortage of empathy. In the like, world. Yeah, yeah, like I can't understand it when you see people like, especially the abuse of religion, like we're going to tear children from their mothers because this is what God wants. I was like, it, it doesn't, like, but to hear people say it with passion that it computes for them, I was like, there's a real shortage of empathy now. And yeah, I just, I wanted to look at that, but I, I really often feel that, uh, for the other side when I'm trying to hear things. Like, you have to be able to change your brain. I've changed my brain so many times, and that's what happens to so many people in this book, is they flip, and they flip, and they flip again. I feel like that's just what happens in life. But do you think that that is more the province, let's say, of a novel? So for instance, right, the character of the general in this book, who I'm, I don't think I'm giving away any spoilers, is based on Sharon. Um, pretty closely in some way, although not identified as Sharon. Do you think that because that character is presented as the general, so slightly distanced from his real world identity, but also because you're weaving in personal material of his life, tragedy, so tragic, you know, yeah. family tragedies, things like that, that you can build empathy for a figure who, if we were reading a nonfiction or a news account, we might not have empathy for because of our poli because of politics. Uh, thank you for being such a close reader. So there's a character that's called the general in this book who's in a coma and sort of dreaming, you know, the whole history of Israel and Palestine and Egypt, all the various wars of the country. Everyone has their real name in this book, like, you know, Arafat is Arafat and Ben-Gurion is Ben-Gurion. All the figures are themselves. Back to wanting to build a balanced, a, you know, again, I have no control of how it's read, or but my intent. Why the one character that became the general, you know, there's a real Prisoner X in life, and I wrote Prisoner Z. What, Prisoner X or Z? Prisoner Z. I did, Mine's I get, Prisoner Z, yeah. Yeah, but Z, in, right? Prisoner I X. Yeah. Uh, I like to say this Hebrew word, Prisoner X. Anyway, I love that letter in Hebrew, X. Anyway, but um, oh, why I made the why the general is the general and not your own is back to wanting people to enter into. It, it, again, we have uh, so many metaphors from their books. A weird thing that happens if you're writing because it's a slow process. By the time things come out, things crack their boundaries. You know what I'm saying? For my Argentina novel, like I was writing a book about the suspension of, one of the big symbols for me was the suspension of habeas corpus being, meaning a country, like the end of democracy. And during the com composition of that book, which took me near a decade, we had September 11th and this country, we still have Guantanamo Bay. We've been to, like there's just people sitting there. You cannot not have habeas corpus and be a democracy. It's not possible by definition, you know? Like those things happen while, you know, while you're writing this book. Um, Oh, so, you know, just this notion, uh, so, like this, Trump is the easiest example for the general here, which is the same facts for the same person get completely opposite 
reactions. The general, Sharon is too loaded a character. I was like, he will yeah. not make this book function because the people who love him love him so fiercely and dearly for the wars he fought, for the times he saved Israel, for the battles he won. And the people who hate him loathe him with the same passion for the Kibya massacre and for standing aside in Sabran Shatila and for those same wars. In the, and I said, like, there is no way if I want people to relax into this world to have that. That's the one character that I said hit that the name Sharon distracts and so it's so you know it's it is the my character is the general but it's also, even if you can map history along yeah but it's also a way for you as the writer to make that character yours right you know yes. you know once you once you remove even in a novel right even if you yes. were right cause, so Ben Gurion in the novel or Omer or um or Arafat have to function sort of as themselves, even though they're figures in the novel, whereas the general can function in whatever way you want him to. Oh, uh, back, you're, yeah. You're a little bit freed from the history in some sense. Yeah, uh, yes. Like, uh, two things. Oh, I'm on a campus. Anyone who's dissertating out there, like, you've read enough books. Finish your dissertation. But, uh... You know, I'm just saying you could research a novel forever, like we've all been down that rabbit hole, and I've learned over the years, like I wanted, he's in a coma in a minimally conscious state, they're different, but I like, I, I literally talked to one friend, back to the nice thing when you have enough books is you can talk to scarier and scarier people, I like called the head of ICU at Columbia, I was like, tell me about comas, I'm like, I'm research, done, write your book, but oh, <laughs> but all I needed to hear, he told me when people do come out of minimally conscious states, they often remember a nurse or stuff like that, but they all have a sense, uh, a lot of people can remember a sense of flying, and I was like, my research is done, you know, like that's, that's what I wanted, but yeah, you to the history, it becomes your own, uh, we were talking in the green room, we both love books, we had such a good green room time, um, but uh, that we were going to nerd out, I truly believe like so deeply, and this is again, nature nurture, back to how my brain is programmed, I believe in fiction, I think it'll, you know, grow hair back and cure cancer and make you taller and solve, you know, save your marriage, whatever, it doesn't really save marriages, but uh, of the other stuff, cancer, yes. But like, you know, this notion, I really feel like if you spend enough time dreaming something and writing it, you will come up with the truth. And uh, again, uh, I am a sufferer, so if you say something nice, I will both appreciate it, but erase it before I hit the parking lot, because uh, I only have room for the negative. But the one thing that, that I can use for like a tuning fork for the writing is when you find out things are true. You know what I'm saying? Like, I dreamed, it was just recently, I was like, only my poor, you know, wife has to hear me scream with joy at something like that, that she's like, that's nerdy, whatever. But uh, no, she's empathetic too. But like, literally, like I dream these, you know, scene, what would Ben Gurion say to the general? What would Ben Gurion say? And, and then literally I was reading it like a different article somewhere and I found like almost my exact quote. Like those are the nerdy, I'm saying nerdy, that's mean to myself, it's not true. I really believe you can do whatever you want, but your obligation is to build a reality. And if you're working hard enough, there's different kinds of fiction and genre fiction, you know, I just, all I care about, I, a fiction to me, it's a fictional reality, which means it's got to be as real as the world it's we're in. It's a reality, right? I mean, I always felt that in the discussion of magical realism, and there's certainly some magical real, yes. realism elements in this book, that the key word is not magical. It's realism, it's real. right? It's got to be a three-dimensional, tactile reality, or else we as readers can't step yes. inside of it. And, and that's why I believe in this form, and it's funny, I've been writing play, I had a, uh, one play, and I've got another play I'm working on, so I do see it's not cheating on form. If I'm talking about, if I'm doing a play event, I'm like, theater, live theater, is the purest, truest form. But nonetheless, fiction is the purest, truest form. <laughs> I really do believe that. But it's the only thing, back to those reality, that becomes memory. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't say, like, oh, when did that happen to me? Oh, that was Al Pacino in Dog Day Afternoon. Like, go straight to a neurologist. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't remember snippets of a painting. There's, the only time you say, like, when did that happen to me? Oh, I read that. And that, to me, is because... You, words are just symbols. They all have different meaning. You know, when I, when I make my characters tall, you know, they're like 5'9 to me. You know, like if you're 6'2 out there, even casting that play, the, the, you know, the young writer when I wrote the play was like 20 and the old writers were probably like 30. But when I finally, it was based on a story when like 20 years later when the play goes up, I was like, the young writers are like 46. Yeah. You know, like, and so, but yeah, like it's, words are symbols and the, like you absorb these symbols and you, like if I just ask you to close your eyes and I say like childhood kitchen, we all see, I have no idea. I always make like West Coast and I was like, oh, just Meyer lemons. 
You know, in New York, it's just like a, a rusty bagel in the street. Anyway, but like, not, you know, I'm just saying, if I asked you to think breakfast or childhood kitchen, we all, it, you build the books out of your own reality and out of your own mind, and it really, it becomes, it truly is as true as anything else you know if, it, if the world well, because works. memory is fiction. I mean, in a certain way, or memory works like fiction. I think we, yes. we, you know, we tell those stories. If you know, I, I always doubt my memory if someone who was there shares it. You know, my brother and I, I once wrote an essay about something, and and he called me and he said, "Oh, that's exactly how I remember it." And I thought, you know, I must have gotten it wrong, or you and I yes. must have conflated our memory somehow, because there's no possible way. So that personal kind of creation of memory, I think, is one of the reasons that we connect so closely with fiction. But I think that's a writer's head that you're talking, like I always say literally, you know, if you tell me my name's not Nathan now, I don't say yes it is. Like I don't even lean into anything. Mm -hmm. I lean out of it, that's my book. Lean back of it. But like, you know, but like, you know what I'm saying, if you tell me that's, you know, not my name, I'll be like, do you know something? Um, you know, am I having a mini stroke? Is this a dream? I got up at 2 a.m. LA time to fly here. Like, and you know, like that's what's the sure people are who terrify, you know what I'm saying? Our prisons are filled with people because innocent people that somebody says like, yeah, that's the dude, you know, like it's so terrifying to me. Anyone who's not willing to be like question, you know, that questioning I think is what keeps me interested all day. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I share that too. I mean, you know, I, I walk out and see something. I was like, did I do that? Did I, you yeah. know, did did I actually make that phone call? Did I somehow crash my car? Or you know, yeah, you yeah. know where's that reality, right? Yeah. And, and it. So let's go back. I want to ask you a question. You were saying something about as you've gotten more experienced as a writer, you've been able to kind of take more risks in terms of, or or more of that circular as opposed yeah. to like A to B. Um, and I'm curious about that a little bit, and also about the relationship maybe within that context of short fiction and long fiction, right? Because it seems to me that stories have, short stories have to be a little bit more A to B um, because of the constrained space, whereas a novel can be a kaleidoscope yes. um, in some way. Do you think that's, is that true for you? Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's what, back to those, I mean, I remember that lesson in grad school. I was so frustrated after the first year of my MFA. You know, it was like, and I spent a whole summer in Jerusalem writing stories, like, and I brought these stories back, like, standard. I was like, is this what you want? And they were like, yes. And they gave me a, and they gave me a career. I was like, oh, it was really silly. I was like, is this, what, this is what you, yeah, this is how a story should be? Like, yes, that's how a story functions. Uh, that was a good learning lesson. Well, it's just a compressed story. The stories take as much world building as a novel, but it's a compressed form. It's somewhere, it's like a spring-loaded poem. I, I don't even know what to tell you. I love the form. I think it's great for the modern age. Like, I love the space of it. As many short stories have changed my life completely as, like, whole novels, so I love that form. But I, I guess, yeah, my only non-rule I teach at NYU, and I teach, they don't make us come in much, but... Um, um, I was like, they're streaming this. Don't make us come in more. Anyway, but... Um, uh, oh yeah, just a novel just needs to, be, things need to need the space. It's not about saving a reader's time or being efficient or, you know, I, I love an economy of language. A novel needs the room it needs. So yes, if you want to build the, you know, a magic realist allegorical love story about, you know, the whole history of Israel-Palestine based on intifada, like, I, I just need more than 20 pages for that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. But you do, I mean, in some of the stories you kind of tap into. Some of the yeah. stories are quite expansive. I mean, yeah. you know, they what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, for instance, is a story that begins as a kind of homage in yes. a way, um, and then basically becomes a kind of capsule history in the way you're talking about. Oh, well, so maybe that that answers this question and that like one before which is how you learn as a writer like most writers work in one direction you read those first novels are thinly veiled but I used to call myself I, like uh, shy up here and then someone literally screamed out from the audience you're not shy and I was like I'm not shy I'm private which is different so like for me my first real grown up story I call it an adult story but then it sounds pornographic but um, that's the next book that's March uh, <laughs> my family's very conservative my sister's like I really like it it's porn pornographic anyway but um, you know I wanted to write about like if I write every day till I die and no one reads it you know do I die a writer 
Like, that's all I wanted to know as an unpublished writer whose plan was to write every day until I die without anyone reading it. But, like, for me to write that, I had to set it in, like, I went to a Stalinist prison in 1952. You know what I'm saying? Like, I needed that distance. I had to go far to get close. That's how mm -hmm. I worked. And with each book, I, like, learned to mine more closely, and that's been the education. And that, this story, what we talk about when we talk about Anne Frank, where my family were fifth generation Americans, like, the only accent in our family, you know, a Jewish family is, like, Boston is Cousin Masha. You know, like, we don't have, the Boston accent is literally the only accent I heard growing up. That's as far back where my people, that's, I think they just came from there. But we were, like, raised like kids of the Holocaust, my sister and I. We have Holocaust brain. She just called me yesterday to say someone didn't believe we weren't, like, children of that, like that. We didn't have grandparents survivors or parents survivors. Like, they just couldn't believe it. Oh, point is, my sister and I always made shorthand. When we meet new people, you know, like, I'd be like, oh, David, you'd be like, would he hide us? Like, that's what we did. Would they hide us? <laughs> our whole lives, my sister and I, that's our shorthand when people walk away. Would they hide us? I'd say, like, he'd hide us, she'd drop a dime in a minute, and we mean it, and we never, tr my sister and I, if we don't think you'll hide us, you are done. We do, we will be, we're polite, but we will not trust. And it took me, like, till I was, you know, whatever, in my 30s to be like, or 40s, whatever it was, to be like, oh my God, that's such a bizarre, I never even, your world is always normal to you. You know what I'm saying? In California, I can't even tell you, I kicked a piece of citrus by accident crossing the parking lot. I was like, there's citrus. It's just <laughs> normal to you. It's not normal to me. But like, you know, oh, but that moment changed me as a writer where I started to learn to mind myself. And that's why I was leaving Israel last book tour and I was on the way to the airport and there was this story on the front page of the newspaper about Prisoner X who had just killed himself in his cell and loss of life, as I always said. People are like, yeah, I can name a few. Anyway, but um, nonetheless, thank you to Kafka, because this saves me 20 minutes of explaining. It's Kafka-esque. This guy had an exist, like, until, there was no Prisoner X until he died. When he killed himself, he, he was disappeared into the system. So like, wait, he didn't live until he died, and there was no cell from, like, whence to hang himself until a successful hanging. Like, at the point of hanging to death, there became a man and a cell. That was of interest to me. But also, that he was a spy, and, and the few pieces, facts that I found out about the spy, he was so much like me, you know. Maybe he got more Zionism, and I got more Bible, and he was Australian. But very similar backgrounds, moved to Israel. It's about this change. For someone to adopt a new country, to adopt its ideology, he was so diehard when he moved to Israel, he joined the Mossad. You have to be pretty serious to like do that, and then did deep cover stuff, and then became a traitor. And I thought, like, what flips you? Like, what flips you when you're, what about your ide ideology can go so extreme that you move to a new country and join its vaunted spy service, and then you flip? to the other side, and I thought, we know why people flip, because, you know, they're being blackmailed, or, you know, there's, you know, like, there's a sex tape, there's a, they've been passed over for promotion, they want a president. there's all kinds of reasons to collude, you know, but none, nonetheless, I thought, like, what if somebody flipped for empathy, and that gave me the character, mm -hmm. but also, I thought about this, all the spy stories we know are bad spies. You know what I'm saying? You don't hear the good spy stories mostly because things go well. But I, anyway, the point is this is the kind of guy, when I was reading about him, he'd be like, I'm on a mission. You know, and I thought that's the kind of spy I would be and that's back to that story. I made him the neurotic spy that I would be and that's when this book became really personal. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <clears throat> plot if you want but um, that, that that makes sense in terms of the book because again I think it is that it is a matter of empathy and we do have to access through character right we yes. have to we have to sort of identify with or even fall for this guy a little yeah. bit and those little neurotic details and the fact that we don't actually know at first whether he is paranoid or you know whether there's actually something for him to be paranoid about you know um is a key factor because goes back to what you were saying earlier about kind of doubting your reality yeah. is there someone really out there trying to get me or is that just my general persecution yes. complex yes yeah, I always think someone's out to get me. But uh, it's funny. And, like, even dreaming those things of what a bad spy would do, I made up a way for him to contact his mother because I decided who would my emergency contact be as a spy. It'd be my mom. But I was like, how am I going to call my mom on the sly? And I came up with this thing in the book. It took me, like, months. The, that's my job. Be like, hmm. But I was like, oh, if you made the contact on your email address, you know, if you told someone if you get a change of it, you could actually just change, you know, like, 
change a setting in your Yahoo and it would like send a note to someone and there'd be no record of an email sent. And I was all excited. I was like, I think I found a way to leave no trail to send a message to someone. And then, uh, oh, it was a Manafort, yeah? Mm -hmm. Then I found out Manafort that they were doing a much better version called, is it called drafting? Was it called, yeah. You would write your emails and yes. save them in drafts and give someone else your password and then they could read the letter and delete the draft and there'd be no record. And I was like, oh, if you're like back to those things, I was like, if you're thinking in spy head, I wasn't as good as them, that's so much better, but still. Yeah, that's actually a really interesting way of doing it, right? I'll the, give you my password later. Drafting. That'll be the next, that's for the sequel, right? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So, um, so are, is the new book a novel or is the new book stories? Oh, you're so nice to ask that. Literally, I've, I love my publicist. She's like, have a good event. Mention the new book. Well, anyway, you know, but... Uh, I always like talking about books I haven't no, read. It's, so, it's, easy, it's easier. Uh, um, and then, well, do we want questions tonight? Yeah. yeah. Um, you're so nice to ask about the new book. Oh, one thing back to... I already mentioned this about me saying, what do you do for a living? Nothing. Which of your books should I start with? Watch, you know, Breaking Bad. Like, these bad answers that I give. My titles are so long. And as you can see, if I'm that shy, I just or private, I just trail off. When everyone's like, what's your book called? I'm like, dinner, and then, and then I, it's terrible at parties. The new book's called Kaddish.com, and I'm like, I can say it. Yeah, anyway, perfect. it's about mourning and guilt and, and the ubiquity of the internet. This is the first time I'm ever talking about it in front of people. I don't know that I've said the name out loud more than twice. But back to that religious childhood, I start to think about these conceptions where you're like, does God exist? All these notions, these things that they would tell us God's watching you and watching all, like, these notions that were concepts, we basically have them now, like Amazon has that information. You know what I'm saying? Like literally my wife and I freak out. We're like, should we have tortellini? And then we open Instagram and there's like a tortellini ad waiting. <laughs> like how often does that happen now? And I was like, wow, my whole childhood was spent trying to instill in us that there can be an all knowing something that like a predictive. And I was like, we're not that far along into this internet business. It's still new and we're already have like you know, as long as you're willing to hold a phone, does anyone here not hold a phone? So as long as you're willing to hold your phone, you know, like, and even just, we just had an, uh, one of, uh, a unsuccessful terrorist in New York, but like, they were able to piece his whole, yeah. you know, route to Times Square through CCTV, is that, or that's what the British call it. Anyway, yeah, it's about guilt and the internet and sex and God and mourning. The eye in the sky. Yeah, I just want to say that a friend of mine wanted to write a, didn't end up writing it, but was going to write a book about surveillance, and her thesis was that we want to be surveyed, that in fact, surveillance satellites, CCTV, all this yeah. stuff is basically, um, we're, that's what we're replacing God with. We want someone to be, oh. we want someone to be watching us, to know that we're there. It makes us safe. Oh, I want to talk to you. It makes friend. us feel safe. I'm going to bother you. See, now I'm researching. Okay. Who right. can I bother? Should we turn it over to questions from the audience? All right, so if there's, there's a microphone over here, if yeah, you raise your hands, we'll call on you, but please wait till you get the microphone so everybody can hear your question. And Perfect. don't be shy. This is my favorite, the pregnant pause part of the evening. <laughs> I'll soak it in. Thank you, that wasn't so bad. Hi, my question is, do you completely plot out your novels before you start them, or are you just moving along and it and it takes shape as you write it? Oh, uh, yeah, this literally goes back to that. Everyone heard that? Yeah, do I plot or does it take shape? Yeah, I really, uh, my process, um, this is, I'm super into dissociative states in the subconscious, and uh, I've learned to, I can't believe it. I think there really is a subconscious. Like, yes, I just worked. Uh, there was a Colson Whitehead quote uh, read at the beginning. I heard through the back. But literally, I'll say like, uh, Colson, you want to have lunch? You know, five months. Uh, April twenty third. I'll be like, I can't. I'll be on page four of chapter nine. Like some friends really map and know, and they map their books and then they execute. I really feel my way through. It's like a super back to a religious thing, it like feels like gut and faith, but it's something, I'll write towards a thing, like the ending of this book is impossible, I, I call it executing the inexecutable, I don't want to read anything, it, it's like not worth it for me, I sit alone in a room all day, now with me pup, but like, I don't, what's my life if I write something that I think can be written, so every story or novel has to seem like it can't 
be written. I learned this back at the beginning, one of those early stories. I just had an idea, what about like a Hasidic man, like a big bellied, white bearded Hasidic man who looks like Santa Claus? What if he has to work as Santa Claus to pay for his synagogue? You know, like I thought about that, but I said, but not as a joke. What if it's, I want to write a really heartfelt, and you know, like that to me is like, but it's only a joke, you know, like, and those are the kind of things like starting out where I'm like, that's impossible, you know, like, and then I write it, I have met in the 20 years since every single Jewish Santa in America, there are so many, but, um, but yeah, so I write towards something or from something or from an idea, but yeah, it has to be impossible and gut and I've learned to sketch and not touch for a long time now when I uh, like put those ideas away and then when I sit down hopefully they're just like sitting there trust your subconscious always be writing and then oh, we we're talking about multiple projects I, w I think maybe I don't know if it's why you teach but like I can save my students like so many years of like dumb suffering or like things like that like just yeah multiple projects is great you're never stuck Uh, uh, yeah, I was just wondering if there's, uh, I guess, not that you would represent the whole is Israeli state, but is there, is there, <laughs> is there a way that, that you think that the state could go or that, could, uh, that they should be doing towards peace? That there's, there's something that hasn't been explored that you'd like to have seen expressed. Oh, uh, yeah, I have like a million, you know, we usually fight these out in the signing line, you know what I'm saying? Like I just... Uh, I have so many conversations about that. Like, uh, I'll give, I literally will do her like a reverse non-answer. That's an answer. Is for like to take a deep breath and saying, I'm not asking. We all want to send our. We have a national public health emergency. I was in Pittsburgh like three days before shaking those hands. Like I was, you know, in Rochester hotel room crying, like waiting to hear. I was like, I just met these people to be like, you know, did this guy survive? Did that person survive? Like guns like you know anyway we all it's used to be a metaphor but now it's like a literally a public health emergency that people are responsible for you know what i'm saying this can be stopped but nonetheless we all want to send our kids to school and have them come home safe every day that's it so i'm not asking anyone that's why i feel like a lot of people back to that idea that come to me how can you say that you're trying like I didn't ask you to die you know what i'm saying when i moved to israel i i talk about this a lot i was ready to die for peace because we were building something. I wasn't being in the army. I was just, you know, being in Jerusalem. And I just was, I just wanted to be a part of something that special. And I was like, I will die for this. You know, I, I don't feel that way anymore for a lot of reasons. But nonetheless, I feel like uh, I have a million ideas, but all of them start on the basis that I'm not asking anyone to die or to do anything where they feel existentially threatened that they are going to be murdered on both sides. If we start, if we back up from there, I think we can do a lot. You know, this notion, both when I talk to truly fierce, extreme people, it's this idea as if the other side doesn't mourn, it's dead. You know, it's like a, it's an insane notion. Even if somebody has to put that face on, even if someone says it, every, you know, like, so, yeah, I got plenty of ideas, but, uh, you know, no, uh, when I run things, it's going to be really different. <clears throat> There's going to be no surge pricing. Hi, so you mentioned getting an MFA and t taking creative writing classes and as someone who has also done such things, I know I heard the line a lot like don't write about political things, like that was supposed to be bad for your craft or something. Yes. <laughs> so I'm wondering, first of all, did you hear that? And if so, how did you get oh. over it? And also, what do you tell your students now? Uh... Oh, the best part of an MFA? Yeah, you hear all kinds of things that you're never, like, that traumatize you forever. Like, that's the whole point of getting an MFA, is to, like, get pushed towards the middle, so there's, like, an MFA, you know. A, first of all, if anyone's doing their writing, if you feel like a weirdo, or you feel other, or you feel bizarre and alone in your writing, that's called a new voice. So that ends up being good. You know what I'm saying? Like, but, yeah, I hear all that stuff. No, this was a very dumb choice for a subject, but... Uh, it's literally like an explosive subject by, by nature. Uh, I don't care about, oh, you know what? This is a talk I've had with Colin McCann a bunch of times. Like, you, you make these rules, and then you break these rules. So the point is, Colin used, I always use him an example where he's like, historical fiction, I'm totally against it. Like, it was his rule. Like, absolutely not. And then he wrote Dancer, and then he, you know, wrote Let the Great World Spin. And like, you know, then it just changed his life. All he does is historical fiction. So I'm saying... Have your rules, believe in them, and then break them when you want. That's the hope, what makes fiction good. The only rule that stands for me, the only rule that, I've never, that doesn't bend, 
I have one rule that drives everything is your obligation is to story. So you want to go to a party on Friday night and you didn't finish your work? No party. That's your personal obligation. And you have a paragraph that you think is so beautiful and so funny and be so beautifully wrought, like, does the story need it? Then it goes. So, yeah, everything else, believe it and then break it. But yes, there's a, I think the community of writers is worth the trade of being an MFA for all the crazy stuff that I carry around after. You know, literally, I'm so obsessed with reality. In this book, there's like an angle where I say there's a cypress, I was like, you know, technically if you were on this balcony, on this street, and look this way, you know, southward in Jerusalem, you wouldn't actually see a cypress tree from that specific house. And my uh, editor said to me, like pulling her hair out, she was like, I have an idea. What if we publish it as a novel and then you can make stuff up? So anyway, yes, I'm obsessed with things from MFA, which is truth, 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 and then I forget that I'm allowed to make stuff up. So yes, do whatever you want, but if the story needs it. Do we have time for one more or no more? We or, have yeah? time for two more questions. Okay. You mentioned it a little bit in, in your remarks, but could you talk a little bit more about... Um, to what extent or how do you feel about being defined as a Jewish American author? Um, oh yeah, I really spent like, tw I was so sensitive about it being, because it caught me by surprise. Literally, I like wrote these nine stories, like literary stories about Hasidim, you know, and I was like so shocked. Again, people would be like, how do you feel? Like there are worse comparisons. I was, I get put in a nice, you know, basket of deplorable Jews, like it's a lovely tradition, but I was just so shocked. I guess it's what, you know, I felt other my whole life. I wrote a piece after Charlottesville for the Times about this, like how I spent my whole life feeling other in this. It's bizarre. Like my grandparents, I have like two of my great, it's, I have great greats that came to, I'm a fucking Mayflower Jew. Like why this idea that I have to be like, well, I'm not a, I'm like, the idea, it's about objectification, that I'm supposed to absorb, you're welcome to see a little Jew up here because I'm a little Jew, but I feel big, I feel strong at the gym, and I just feel like me, not like a Jew, you know, like, like a person. And that idea that I'm supposed to absorb other people's objectification, it took me so long because the Jew, then I understood, I was like, I, I love the support of the community. It's what I want about fiction, because I can. it's clear to me with the Argentina novel. I wrote a novel set in 1976 in Buenos Aires where I was six years old and not there and not part of my life and I'd never you know, been there until I went for a wedding. Like This notion, all I care about is if things ring true for people who have lived a moment or been to a place. So it so means the world to me when things resonate for people who have lived the things and it better be story, better be you know, universal. But yes, I was very sensitive about the label because it didn't make sense to me. And I was like, I am an American writer. But it got clear to me. I tell stories. That's my job. You can see whatever you want. We all make categories. And the only thing that's flipped it is, you know, is the fact that the ultimate seat of power is, you know, is that we are, you know, receiving support, you know, and uh, tolerance for white supremacists. They're, you know, like that's, so now I write with 10 yarmulkes on my head and I'm, you know, now I am, I, literally for the first time, like I am a Jewish, Jewish writer. Don't, you know, like it, only as a point, that is a personal political position, you know, because uh, we have madness in this country that we, you know, again, back to empathy. We need to make room, for, there's plenty of room here. Because I just flew over it, it's huge. Plenty of room. We have one of uh, this. This woman in the front here. Wait, wait, wait for the mic. Thank you for mic running. Thank you. I, I can't tell you how thrilled I am that you came to Claremont. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, um, can you tell us, share with us, uh, what writers did you read as a young person who really inspired you to write, and who do you read now? Oh, uh, the who do I read now? I keep getting stumped. I like mumble through it where people are like ask me, have really specific expectations. First of all, I don't know if like a dad gene kicked in. I know I just want to hold like big presidential biographies. By the way, who here read Evicted? I just finished Evicted. Anyone read that? Oh man, is that a good book? I'm, I, I, my nonfiction has, like I'm crazy with nonfiction. I read broadly and all over the place. I mean, half your job is then keeping up with friends so you're not in trouble. And I love my friends' work. That's how you stay friends. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I read all over the place. But growing up, A, and back to that idea, you know, back to that, you know, what we're talking about identity and flipping the rubber band. I am so thankful for the world of stories that I grew up in. Like, back to me being able to imagine the way I receive the Bible, like, I don't know who Abraham is and Moses and, but like Avraham Avinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, like 
we were taught that stuff, I mean, you know, serious, you know, old women and serious old men, you know, and one teacher with gray tights, but, uh, but uh, whew. anyway, but um, like, you know, just, you know, though they gave me stories so real that it was like, it, you know, they were living, not remember, not even living historical figures, but happening. And that, tr like, that is how I got, you know, how my brain formed. Maura Geyer in first grade, we had this teacher, she'd be in jail now. She literally would act out the Bible, like we're doing the burning bush. She would just, you know, set a garbage pail on fire in the middle of the classroom. <laughs> like she would dress us up, like we acted out the Bible. Like I got to be born once, that is a very complicated story. Uh, you don't want to hear that tonight. So yeah, that primal stuff was a huge thing. And then, uh, but for me, yeah, I love, uh, you know, I already mentioned Americans, like I love Marilyn Robinson and Carver and Cheever, and I love the Russians and yeah, the Ru Gogol for me. Yeah, that's a good thing to end on. When you talk about, here's an MFA in one line, <laughs> but like, you talk about a story when students are like, oh, I want to write about a story that happened on Wednesday, but I don't know how to make it Tuesday. And I love, the story of the nose is all anyone needs to know about fiction. A guy wakes up, his nose is off his face, but it's running around town as a, you know, a, a counselor of a higher rank and he can't approach his own nose because it's socially awkward to approach your nose when you have, you know, a nose of a higher rank. And I was like, that's it. That's all you have to tell us. We could follow. How am I going to get my nose back and how am I going to say excuse me to such an important nose? Like, anyway, reading that story changed my life. Um, uh, thank you all for coming out and thank you, David. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Thanks so much to both of you. Thanks all of you for being here as well. Um, we hope to see you next semester. We'll be announcing our next season in January.